So with that being said, the title of our message today is, uh, this is <laughs> interesting standing up with Zoom and with you here, but uh, it's always more, always more. And this wasn't in my notes because it just happened, but as we're in worship, we have the kids worshiping and I love it. They're raising their hands and they're singing to God. Well, little Timmy gets up and he's one of the first to be up and raise his hands and you know, I'm in the room with him and he's on the couch and he gets up and then he comes stands next to me and he's worshiping and then he puts his arms around my leg and is just holding my leg and just, just love me. Not like, not in a needy hug, just a hug like I love my daddy. And then I pick him up and I hold him and I'm holding him next to me and we're worshiping together. I got his head on my shoulder and then he just get, picks his head up with a smile and he gives me his little kiss that he loves to give me and he puts his head back down. And we're just seeing, I'm just like, I love you, God. I love you, Lord. This is it. And I think that that story alone could probably eclipse the entire message because there's always more with God. You know, we might be in the same room with him sitting on the couch and he's over here, but we could get up and we could go stand next to him if we wanted. We could begin hugging his leg if we wanted. He would pick us up if we wanted. We could give him an embrace if he wanted. There's always more to our relationship with God. We can always get closer and closer and closer to God. And a lot of it's dependent on just how much do we want at any given moment. At any given moment. Jesus says in John 10.10, The thief does not come except to steal and kill and destroy. I came, Jesus said, that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Abundantly. And that word abundantly means exceeding some number or measure. It's way beyond. That it's over and above. It's more than necessary. Sometimes when we have more than necessary, we don't know what to do with it, right? We have so much, you know, it just ends up in a barn or ends up outside or sometimes we may give it away. Sometimes if we have, sometimes, you know, when you go to the grocery store and you come home and you got a kitchen full of groceries, you're like, oh, I have all this food now. And you begin to just eat everything, but you kind of have to slow down and save it. Especially when you have four kids, you need to ration it a little bit. Let's not get through the whole bag of Doritos when we just got it home. But that word abundantly also means something further, something further, something superior, extraordinary, surpassing and uncommon. So we have more than is necessary, exceeding a number, something further, something uncommon, and also preeminent superiority advantage or more remarkable and more excellent. That when Jesus comes to give life, he gives it exceedingly further than we can imagine. He gives us more than is necessary, just the day-to-day get by. He gives us something further than farther than we ever expected we would go. He gives us something that is uncommon that not everyone has. Even the believers, if you remember on the Mount of Transfiguration, right? Jesus had many people who followed him. He had others who followed him closer. He had the 12 disciples, but then he had the three who went up on the mountain with him who were willing to go closer, to go farther, to go wherever he was. And that was more excellent. That was better than their other life. They had an alright life fishing, but this was even better. And the further and closer they got to him, the more remarkable it was. Uh, and apparently for Timmy, what was ever in his room is more remarkable than the coloring pages I have for him. But we always want more in life, do we not? Uh, we, you know, we always want more. We always need more. Sometimes that's not bad. You know, we always have to take another breath. We always have to have something else to eat or drink eventually if we want to continue living. And even the person who seeks having less, that Buddhist monk perhaps up in the middle of Tibet, they still want more of less. They want to reach enlightenment. They want more of having less. That there's this desire in us to have more. And that's not necessarily a bad desire, right? It's good to have more sometimes. But having more, seeking more, again, isn't always a bad thing. It only becomes bad when it begins to consume us, take over us, as it often does. And whenever we want more of something, it eventually takes over. They say that when you have things, But it begins to take over us. No matter what we do, whether good or bad, it should take over us. The more 
music you listened to as a kid, the more you'd start dressing like the, the musicians you were into. You could tell what type of music people are into because it begins to consume their life uh, and take over them. And that can be a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, when someone goes to the gym all the time, they get consumed with it, and then their body gets consumed with muscles, and that can be a good thing. But often, when we're seeking certain things, we're also missing out on what's really more. If we're seeking too much earthly, we're missing out on what's more heavenly. You know, Jesus said this parable to them in Luke 12, uh, the land of the rich man produced plentifully, and he thought to himself, what shall I do, for I have no more room to store my crops? And he said, I'll pull down my barns and build greater ones, and there I'll store up all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take rest, eat, drink, and be merry. You've prepped for the end of the world. You're good to go. But God said to him, you fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then those who, And then whose will those things be which you have provided? Like who, You stored up all this stuff, but you're dead now, so someone else is going to get it. Even Solomon says that you work hard all your life and build up mass things. And then when you die, someone else gets it. What kind of vanity is that? Solomon says, so is he who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Jesus says in Matthew six nineteen, he says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in or steal for where your treasure is. There your heart will be also. You know, we, we finally got the kitchen done uh, after many months of work and labor. And it's nice to have a nice kitchen. And it's nice to have a, a decent house, a nice house with nice land. But at the same time, if God wants us to go somewhere else, we're ready to give this up. We like it and we don't want to go through the process of moving again. But if God would have us move again, we absolutely would. Because um, what's that missionary's name in the book you're reading? Jim Elliott? Right? He says, he is no fool who gives up what he can't keep to get what he can't earn, I think is the thing that he says. Because, man, it's not foolish to give up these earthly things that are going to rot anyway to pursue after the things of God. And even then, God always gives you more. I'd rather be in the right place with God and be lacking certain things in life than to have all the things I want and to be not right with God. And not that we can't have the things that we want, and the things of God as well. A lot of the time, those things will align. But there's always a sacrifice, and I've said this before, life is about decisions. You know, when you wake up, for me it was this morning, do I hit the snooze button again? I can't hit it any more than once this morning. That's all I have time for. Uh, Every second of every day, we're faced with a decision. Um, Do I get up now? Do I get a head start? Do I take five minutes to the Lord? Do I rush ahead with what I'm busy with? Do I have the side salad? Or do I have the fries? There's always a decision. And sure, you know, I I could get more done with the house this month. As You know, the more you look, it's like you finish certain things, you're like, oh, well, then the floor needs to be done. Oh, well, then this needs to be done. And then this and that. So God bless you. At some point, you got to stop looking. And at some point, I have to say, you know, it's really not worth it to me. I want to spend the rest of the summer vacationing with family. Me, mom, when she comes out, spending time with my kids. And painting the door can wait. It can wait and and hold me to that. (laughs) You know, because sometimes the things that feel worth it now, God bless you, but won't be in just a short amount of time. You know, will I make more money selling the house doing that? Who knows? But even then, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, if the kids are out of the house and maybe gone, am I really going to care if I spent that Saturday getting that chore done? Or would I rather have spent the time doing something with them? And again, not that responsibility should be totally discarded, But the point is, what is worth it? What has the most value in our lives? Where are we putting our treasure, Jesus says? Where your heart is, there your treasure will be. If my heart is in the house, this is the treasure. I'm not going to want anything done. I'm just going to want to do the house until my treasure is the way I want it. But it should be about heaven. And I'm going to miss out on the best things, seeking those good things. And having more possessions in life, that's not the point of today's message. I'm not here to talk about giving up your possessions or getting more possessions or what to do with them or being a good steward. That's another topic together. But what I really want to share is is to encourage you and encourage me as well. This has been something that's been on my heart for months. Is about going further. About experiencing more and not for experience sake. 
but knowing God more, about going further, that abundance further, about having more in that abundance way, about doing more, and about being nourished more spiritually. You know, I was uh, praying and talking with friends the other day, and um, one of them said, you need to do what you know is going to draw you and your family closer to God. Whatever that is, if it's going to draw you closer to God, that's what you need to pursue. And I can remember, I grew up in northern New Jersey. Never really went over the New York State border north much. We usually, we'd go down to the, the city. But, you know, maybe we'd go to Suffern and there was a 7-Eleven there or there was, you know, like a bar there, stuff we would go to. Uh, not in high school, but we wouldn't go much further north. There wasn't much reason to go further than that. We'd go to areas in Jersey or go all the way to the city if you want to go somewhere. And I remember my friend worked for a flower delivery company and I went on um, one of her delivery routes with her and we went up the thruway through all, you know, you start going up the thruway from New Jersey and it's all these woods on the side. And I'm like, wow, we're in the middle of nowhere. And I go now, that's not the middle of nowhere. But then all of a sudden we get to Monroe and there's the Woodbury Commons. And I never heard of Woodbury Commons. I've never been there. Apparently it's a big tourist spot from New York City. But I'm like, there's a mall here? I didn't think there was anything up here. And it was just 15 minutes up the road, up the highway. And there was a whole other mall at my disposal that I probably would have been at all the time. And probably would have found a good deal on that designer stuff. And I can also remember moving to New York State in 2003. We moved to a town called Chester. And to me, it was the middle of nowhere at the time. There were some cows, uh, there were some smells. And as I lived there for 15 years, I realized this isn't the middle of nowhere. It's pretty crowded. But when I first got there, compared to where I grew up, it was rural. And I can remember uh, driving in the car, just bored, not having any friends up there, uh, and having nothing to do, and driving up the road. And I would drive up Old 17, which was this road that was next to the highway, towards... Uh, a little bit further up the road, and I would say, okay, there's nothing up this way. I'm going to turn around and go back home. Well, little did I know, one more block, and I would have been in the town of Goshen. But I was so lost. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know the Lord at the time. I was afraid to go any further. That That's where I stopped, and I said, oh, there's, there must be nothing there. I don't see anything. That's enough for me. Let me turn around and go back home. And not long after that, I came to know God. And guess where the church was that I would go to? Well, it was in Chester, but then it was eventually in Goshen. And then I made friends. I, I would be in Goshen all the time. I'd be all over New York State, end up going to Pennsylvania, up to the next county in New York State, doing ministry up there, going camping further up in New York. So there was a whole lot and ended up God making my whole life north of that spot where I would stop and say, this is about as far as I want to go. There's nothing else up there. Let me turn around and go back without the Lord. But with the Lord, my whole life existed north of there. I even found my wife up there. We went on missions group trips with the youth group to the Bahamas, out of the country. Uh, eventually, we followed God to Maryland and now Montana. Montana is somewhere I always wanted to go before I knew the Lord. And then I kind of shelved it, thinking I'd never be able to get there. And now we've lived here for over four years. And we love it. And it's home for us. But the point is, is that there was more. I just couldn't see it yet. And even this morning, as I was uh, preparing the finalized notes and typing them up, I left my glasses upstairs and I didn't realize it. So I was kind of squinting at the computer and all close to the screen. And then it hit me, I don't have my glasses. There's more for me to see. So I had to get up and go upstairs and get my glasses so that I could see uh, because I needed to see more and I could not see without them. My eyes, I can only see so far. Um, I'd probably have to be a librarian back in the day. But are you and I wearing our spiritual glasses? Are we walking around spiritually nearsighted thinking this is it well, i can't really see what's over there you know i was watching the movie unforgiven uh this old clint eastwood movie and there's this young kid that comes along with them to try and get this bounty uh money uh to kill these guys who did something wrong and he's all claiming to be this great shot and everything and not and everything but he can't see when he starts shooting at them <laughs> <laughs> he keeps missing because he can't see. And then they trick him. Is there a hawk in the eye? Because he's nearsighted. He's like, okay, I can shoot 50 yards. And they finally believe him that he can shoot about that far. But he couldn't see farther than that. And I wonder, can we not see farther than in front of our face spiritually? Have we allowed God to, to put on his eyes on us and see what's beyond? Like Elijah and the prophet, where they're surrounded by the enemy. And then the prophet's not worried. But his friend and servant is. 
And he says, God, open his eyes. And when God opens up his spiritual eyes, he says, oh, wait a minute. We have angels all around us. We have nothing to be afraid of. In fact, they're the ones who have something to be afraid of. And mom, I can remember when I was little, you would tell me about my spiritual eyes and my earthly eyes and how now my earthly eyes are wide open, but my spiritual eyes are like this. And the more you seek God, the wider they'll be open till finally you're in heaven and your heavenly eyes are wide open and your earthly eyes are closed. You know, 1 Corinthians says, but that which is perfect comes, then that which is imperfect shall pass away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, and I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see as through a glass dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am known. And I think that as we desire to mature in Jesus, as we grow up in him, as we spend more time with him, we'll begin to see things more and more differently and begin to see things prayerfully with his eyes by his spirit clarified by his word than opposed to the way we see it another quote from that book uh that i should read about jim elliott that hey you know when god's calling you to do something even if you get godly advice against it if you know god is calling you to do it then to do it because god is showing you something that you should pursue and you should go after and sometimes the practical arguments don't stack up against that and I thought about this one the other night, you know, while we're, we were out, we went out to dinner at Chili's and the service was nice, but it was slow. There's just no one working anymore. Uh, and everyone working was new. And when we were at Chili's for probably three, <laughs> three hours between sitting down and waiting for our food. And, and I didn't care in a sense, because I just wanted to go out and spend time with my family and get out of the house. And uh, it was kind of hot at that time. So it was nice to be in the air conditioning. But I don't know if I'm going back anytime soon. But I thought about the table of God, right? And we were waiting on honey mustard. We'll never be waiting. If you go to heaven and we're at his table, he's never going to say, oh, you know what? We're out. We don't have enough people working. You're just going to have to wait. There's going to be more and more and more servants coming up, angels coming up serving. You want another piece of cake? We've got a million cakes. You want another rack of lamb? You can have that. You want some more lentils, Mima? We've got plenty of lentils. It's never going to run out. You know, Jake was asking for milk last night and I had the last bit of milk. And I'm, I'm sorry, bud. It's all mom's fault. <laughs> we have to go to the store tomorrow and we'll get more milk then because we ran out because four kids, we need a cow to keep up with our milk demand. But God's table is never going to run out. And scripture talks about him having a feast for us in heaven, but on earth. David says, you pre prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. David's enemies aren't in heaven. They're on earth. That David was able to feast with God while he was surrounded. That David had everything he needed abundantly before him, like you would at harvest time when he was in the middle of a desert. That God says, I go to prepare a place for you, and I'm not going to drink of the cup of the vine until then. If Jesus is working on an awesome feast for us, nothing's going to fall short. You know, we were kind of scrambling this morning because we forgot how much there really is to do. But you know what? We will be better prepared next week. But when you get to heaven, God's not going to be unprepared. Be like, go sit here and wait for 10 minutes while we clean a table for you. It's prepared. It's got your name on it. And he knows exactly what you like. At the wedding feast at Cana, Jesus turned water into wine. Remember that they had run out of all that they had. They had drank the good wine. They had drank the cheap wine. And now they were out. And Jesus took that water and mind you, this is 2,000 years ago. It wasn't triple filtered, Evian, Arctic Glacier, 20, whatever it is, bottle of water. It was probably dirty, dingy, you know, normal water back then that people only drank if they absolutely had to. And he turned it into the very best wine that anyone had ever tasted. Right? The Jesus is saying, look, you got nothing, but even I, I'm never going to run out. I can take this water and I can turn it into the best stuff for this feast. And so do you... Picture God's feast like that. What do you picture his feast in heaven and on earth for you and I like? Do we even think we have a seat? Do you think without, you have to sneak into the back and find a spot in the corner? Well, what is that movie? Was it Footloose? They say no one puts baby in a corner, right? Jesus is not going to put you in the corner. You know, we should be humble in life and seek the low seat that God might lift us up. But at the same time, God wants you in the best seat in his feast. That every seat is the best feet at this table. We are all at equal footing at the cross. And do you think there's only so much to go around? That God gave it all to Billy Graham and he's got nothing, nothing left for you? Or that Jack Hibbs is 
plate is full and so you just get the scraps of the table like a dog? No way. God has just as much for you and for me as he does any one of these other saints who are seeking him. In James 4, Jesus' half-brother, he says, uh, where do these wars and fights come from? Do they not come from your lust and war in your body? You lust and you do not have and you kill. You desire to have and you cannot obtain, so you fight in war. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you don't receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on yourself. James is saying, look, like God has everything, everything you need, but maybe you're asking for the wrong things in life. Maybe the things that you want in life aren't the things that God has for you. And sometimes that's really disappointing. You know, we'd love to get a brand new transit van and be able to fit all the kids and take road trips. But maybe God doesn't have that for us. I hope he does. I'm going to keep seeking and trying and see if he's got it for us. But at the same time, maybe God has something else. And whatever else he has is better because I don't want to be upside down and alone or taking this out or maybe it's a lemon. I want what God has for us. And that's just a physical thing. That's just a, a van. And do we really need a van? No. You know, Paul was shipwrecked. Paul was naked. Paul was beaten up. And he was right smack dab in the center of God's feast for his life. And Jesus says, I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Everyone who asks receives and seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any of you who is a father, will you give him a stone? No, if my kids are hungry, I'm not going to give them a stone. You know, we got home late the other night and Jake was hungry. At first I was like, Jake, you got to go to bed. I'm like, no, you know, come out here and get a snack. And it took him 15 minutes to get out of bed and come get it. But I didn't want him to go to bed hungry. I didn't want to, you know, I know what that's like. I love him. He can have a little bit of snack. We were out late. Or if he asked for a fish, will you give him a serpent instead? If he asked for an egg, will you offer him a scorpion? Uh, or will you make him eat the, the, the crickets like the world wants you to eat? Uh, but if you, being evil, know how good to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give of the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Are we asking for the Holy Spirit? Are we asking God to fill us, to use us, to show us, God, is this what you'd have for my life? You've given me blessings. You've given me good things, even if it's a job. This job is great, but do you have more for me? Is, you know, I was talking with friends the other day, and we were talking about something. I'm like, well, have you ever considered that maybe God has more? That this is as far as we're going, but maybe if we gave these things up, God would have more for us. That maybe if it's not even a bad thing. You know, I can understand giving up alcohol or something and God has a better life for you after that. But maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it's the job. Maybe it's, I've got everything good, everything I need here. Why would I go anywhere else? Well, because God has something more for you to do, to be a part of, to experience, to know him more. Right? God didn't move us to Montana just to have a wonderful, awesome, rural Montana life out in the mountains, which you love, but to know him more. And I believe we've come to know him better in our journey coming out here. Uh, and hopefully others will come to know him through that. But is there a time, like I said, does, that his feast runs out? That we get to a point where we go, well, I shouldn't ask for more in life. I shouldn't expect for more. And I get being grateful, right? I'm not saying don't be grateful, don't be thankful, because when we're not, we begin to be unthankful and unholy, and we begin to seek to fill our needs in the flesh. But what I'm saying is, God, you've given us so much. Do you want us to give it back? Is there a time for us to now let go of this that we might take hold of you in a bigger, better way? You know, Lord, can I have more of what you've prepared for me? Do we think that he's done serving us? He's done feeding us? That everything we've come up to this point is all we need in life? No, he's going to keep giving us and keep leading us till the day that we die. So I think Jesus would say to us, come sit and eat. Keep eating. Keep asking for another round of, of, of spiritual meal. Keep asking for another direction of him where we might go. Maybe we've only entered the appetizer room at the wedding. And now it's time to move into the feast room. And now we've been in the feast room and it's time to go on to the dance floor at the wedding. We need to keep moving through our spiritual life and keep asking him and not be afraid to get up from the table, so to speak, and go out and on, get onto God's dance floor. And John uh, 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. You know, heaven's kitchen is never closed. His pantry is never empty. His angels never stop ministering. Because if God ran out of good to give, God wouldn't be God. In fact, the word good comes from God. 
And the Israelites always had manna, but you know what? They didn't always want it. They got sick of it after a while. They started to complain and grumble. I can't believe God's taking care of our knees all day out here in the wilderness. And they asked for quail. And so what did God do? God gave them quail. And they gorged themselves on it when they shouldn't have. And they got sick. But God gave them what they asked for. But what they asked for wasn't good. He gave them leanness in their souls, it says. That their stomachs were full, but their spirit was lean. And that's a tough place to be in. I've been in at times when I bought something that I shouldn't have bought. And it was exciting for a minute. But as soon as I buy it or get it, I'm like, man, I feel lean. I should not have uh, done that. Right, And so I seek God and seek for ways to seek Him and not make those mistakes again. And that's just a little thing. That doesn't count the big decisions in life where we found lean because we didn't wait for what God had for us. We weren't thankful for what God has for us. So we do need to be thankful. But what I'm saying is, I wonder, if we're feeling sick in life, if we're feeling spiritually lean, if our spiritual life isn't fed and... and Yeah, maybe we're praying, maybe we're worshiping, maybe we're going to church. It's not like we're living in sin, so to speak, but we're feeling lean. Is it because we're not feasting on the things of God? We're gorging on the things of flesh? We're seeking God, maybe, but maybe it's to fill our own earthly desires, uh, to be retired or to have more in the bank or to have more toys or whatever it is or more friends or whatever it is in our life. And those things are really making us sick. Even if it's a blessing that we asked God for and it was a good thing that he wanted to give us, but we didn't treat it right. We made it our idol. We pursued it. We began to eat eat, eat of it all the time instead of eating from him, right? Like God gives us good things in life and we should enjoy them. I love taking my kids out on the ATV or going out to dinner with them or having fun with my wife or watching TV. But if those things end up being the only things that I do, even though they're blessings from God, I'm going to end up lean. And like I said, we can always tell where someone's been eating spiritually. As a kid, you listen to music and you know, you start growing your hair out like Kurt Cobain or dressing like the the rock band or the skateboarder that you liked or whatever it is. Um, And some of that's fine. You know, you see clothes you like, you live a certain lifestyle, they match, that's fine. But you can also see as kids go through phases, they begin to turn into these things and do them. And and spiritually, where are we? What have we been eating? What spiritual food is caught up in our beard, so to speak? Uh, What does our spiritual breath smell like when we talk to someone else? Folks caught up in things like the prosperity gospel, you're going to know it. Folks caught up in erroneous teachings and doctrines of demons, you're going to know it because it's what they've been eating and they begin to vomit it back up. And you go, oh, this isn't very appetizing. But they're vomiting it because they've been eating it so much. But others who have been eating healthy spiritual things will begin to share those healthy spiritual things with you. And you're going to want to have a a bite of it because it's not regurgitated in a a bunch of other junk on the floor. You're going to want to take a bite because it's delicious. And it's going to go, ah, yes, this, this is what God has prepared. And he's given them abundantly. You know, I actually got a plate of muffins over there that are abundant, right? Like, and if I have a muffin, I'm going to share with you because I have abundantly. I don't need them all. But if I'm like, oh, these muffins are good, you know, you're never going to get a bite. But God never runs out. He's always ready to fill you abundantly to overflowing. Even if you just ask him this morning to fill you with the Holy Spirit, guess what? You can ask him again right now. God, fill me more. I need you more. As has been said, we leak. We leak, right? Even when we eat, we can't just eat once and expect to be satisfied. It passes through us. It nourishes us. But at some point, it's run its course and we've gotten everything we can out of that. So we need to eat again. We need to drink again. And how much is enough to satisfy you? Is it just a little, a little, a little bird bite at, at, at church or a little bird bite in your devotion? And then the rest of the day, we gorge on other things, right? Is it, uh, you know, someone could tell you that they are uh, dieting in a picture of health, but you look at them and you go, you're not. Well, it's because, you know, maybe they're gorging the ice cream at midnight. Like, go get my midnight snack of ice cream, right? I I can't trick you. I could tell you I'm healthy all day long, but you can tell that I'm obviously eating a certain thing or too much of something. And if you read Proverbs, you see Solomon, that he was seeking these things, seeking wisdom. 
And eventually all those wives that he wanted led him astray. If you read Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, if you haven't read it in a while, check them out in the morning. Those little nuggets of wisdom go a long way. But you know, my life before God was unsatisfied. I can remember being in a bar with friends and looking around. They're all having fun and oblivious, and I'm just going, I can't have fun. This is all vanity. There's got to be more to life than this. There's got to be more than this. I, I am broken. I am upset. I, this, this doesn't fill me. But I didn't yet know Jesus. I didn't yet know that he could be the one to fill me. And I grew up around the church. I just didn't know that there was more than knowing the truth. It was knowing the person of the truth. And unfortunately, if I look around at the American church as a whole, and then I look at Scripture, and I look back around me, and I look at Scripture, and I look back around me, I'm like, is this really it? You know, we looked for churches, and there was a new one that popped up, and I was like, oh yeah, a new church. Maybe we could visit them and see what they're doing. And then I see things about it, and I see the methods that they're using, and I'm just like, why do you, do it? Why do you got to do it that way? Like, why do you have to make it into this whole crazy launch party and we're launching next year? Come to our party. And it's just so trendy and business-like. And I'm like, well, why don't you just have the Bible study? I'm like, well, okay, well, maybe that's what God would have us to do. We'll see. But it just, a lot of it seems vain and, and absent of the feast of God. And it's more about what we think are the things of God. And have you ever considered more for your life? Are you satisfied where you are today? And this is just as much for me. I'm not, I want to be further along the path with God. I'm forty, going to be 41. I, I personally look at my life and go, I should be a lot further. But you know what? God is gracious and I'm going to take every day and I'm not going to say, you know what? I should be further. I'm not going to do anything now. There's no way I can ever catch up. I've been lapped so many times on the racetrack of life that I need to just sit back and forget about it. Now the race is over. No, the race is not over. I need to put my for, foot to the floor on the accelerator, take the turns, take the drive, listen to my, uh, in my earpiece of the Holy Spirit and listen to him and keep going. Because you know what? I don't know. I watch a lot of F1. I know you guys don't. But I don't know when the next accident is going to come and the safety car is going to come out and I'm going to end up in the lead of the race. I need to keep going. It doesn't, even then, spiritually, it doesn't matter if I'm the lead because no one's in the lead. Jesus is in the lead. I just need to keep going and following and pursuing him. No matter what's happening, Paul says, I forget what's behind me and I go after what's before me, the, the promise of God. You know, they say in the world, making moves, right? You know, you're going to upgrade this, you're going to trade in this, you're going to do that, and that's all well and good and it's part of stewardship. But where are you today? Where have you been and have you considered, even if you're in the very best place you've ever been spiritually right now, have you considered that this isn't the end? That God still has more for you. You can still get closer to Him. He might have a place for you to go. Maybe it's China. You know, we talk about backsliding a lot in Christianity, and that's true. We talk about valleys. We talk about mountaintops. But what about the plateaus? What about when we just reach this place and we go, you know what? Spiritually, I'm doing pretty good. I've got my time with the Lord. I've, I'm comfortable at church. I'm comfortable at home. I'm comfortable at work. Maybe I'm even sharing the gospel with my friends. I'm not really doing the things I used to. I'm, I, you know, I still sin, of course, but I'm, it's, it's, you know, I deal with it with God on a daily basis. But there's more. There's never a plateau. It's continual and continually going after him. Do you think God wants you to sit still? Do you think God wants you to, to not know what's next? And not that we shouldn't be planted in an area and potentially be in the same place for the rest of our lives. That's not what I'm talking about physically. I'm talking about spiritually that maybe God wants something else for you. Maybe God's season for you in a place is done and it's time for you to move on. It's time for you to let go of all these good things and take hold of God and see what he has for you next. That's even better. You know, we have friends who moved and they sold all their furniture before they moved. And we're like, we know what that's like. Because sometimes you have to, to be able to lighten the load and move on. And then you end up getting other things, hopefully better when you get there. At the very least, it's better because they're there and you didn't have to drag them with you. But I think sometimes we think we know him and we do know him. And we're content with what we know about God and who we know him to be. But we don't go any further. We don't realize that he's even better than that. He's even kinder than that. 
He's even gentler than that. You know, the landowner with the parables, right? Sometimes I think we think God's a hard man and we sit on our hands and we really just need to get up and go serve him. Because it's not over until it's over. That we need to live a life of faith. If Again, if we're looking at our scriptures, and not that we should compare ourselves directly one-to-one -one with anyone. There's only one Moses. There's only one Abraham. There's only one David. There's only one Solomon. But you know what? There's only one you. There's only one me. When I was sharing with my friends the other day that there's certain things about each of us that God brings us through and seasons us with because God wants to use us and put us in a place because of the way that we'll be used in that place is the way he wants to use us there. That he's not going to put the bacon pan in with the ice cream because then the ice cream will taste like bacon. And you don't want the ice cream all over the... I mean, maybe that's good, bacon ice cream. But he's got certain seasonings and certain flavors on your life. You've been tempered by certain things that God's brought you through that when God puts you in that situation you're going to shine greater than someone else in that situation because you were put there for a purpose. You were made for that. God, Remember, the Bible says that before even the foundations of the world, God knew you and God formed you and God set out a path for you to be in life. So why do we think we need to stop short? Why do we think that, oh, this is it. I'm just going to hang out until I die. No, we need to seek more of what God has for us now. How old for us? And again, not to compare us one-to-one -one with others, but we have friends who are missionaries in China for a long time. And now they can't go back in. And in fact, the ministry is going dormant, as they're calling it, until they have another opportunity to go in. But they sought God for more. And the other people there, they shared other stories about how they were going over there. How one guy lost a basketball game. And that's how he involved, got involved with going over there. Because he lost a bet with one of the leaders. He says, if I beat you in basketball, you're going to go over there. And he went over there and it changed his life. Other guy who was basically homeless and was struggling to know God. He comes to know God and he go, and then a year later he's over there. He's got a job. He ends up getting married and having kids. And he's looking back in the past couple of years. He's like, I was homeless and now I'm serving God in China. And more than that, seeing them baptize people in their bathtubs, blowing up kiddie pools and baptizing them in a small apartment, having these college kids excited for Jesus and thank you for changing my life in the midst of this country that's hostile to the gospel, that's hostile to Christians, where they can't even email us and use words. They have to have a code word for everything and change the letters and try and encrypt it and hide their faces. And God is working and moving. And he doesn't need a launch party. He doesn't need come here for six months, sign up, get the mug, and then we're going to launch out with all this money. No. They're meeting kids in class. They're meeting kids on the street, telling them about Jesus, bringing them back to their home and baptizing them. And you know what? God can do that anywhere. God's doing it there because they're open to it. I'm afraid that a lot of us, we're not open to that here. We want to go and we want to be comfortable. We want to sit down. We, we don't want to be challenged. We don't, want to, we don't want to think that there's more because as soon as we realize that there's more, it makes us uncomfortable and it means we might have to give something up that we hold a little too tightly. But you know what? That's what I want. I want that. I may not want it in the process when I'm giving up the thing I really like, but that's what I want. I want to live a life for God. I want to be like Moses. I want to be like David. I want to be like Paul. Because you know what? We're supposed to be. There's no difference between these people and us. Is there? Were they not full of the Holy Spirit? Were they not given scriptures? Do they not have the same Lord, the same spirit in them as in us, as Paul says? Are we not just as much Christians as them? Has we not been saved just as much as them? Then why do we not give our lives in the same way that, that they do? And I'm not saying we don't, but I think sometimes we get comfortable. We think, okay, just going to church is enough or doing this is enough. And not that we need to do more to earn it, but I implore you and I implore myself and I think God would implore us and beg us to say, I have so much more for you. Don't you want it? You're over there eating a happy meal and I have this wonderful feast prepared for you. You're fine sitting outside the party. Don't you want to come in? Don't you want to come in for the cold? Don't you want to be excited? You know, we're going on these roller coasters next week. We're going to a theme park. And wouldn't it be funny if we drove all that way and, and went all that far and we just stood there and Looked at the roller coaster and said, wow, that looks like so much fun. Look at them go around that loop. They're screaming and hollering and loving it. Oh, but I can't go on it. I'm afraid to go on it. But don't you know you're not going to get hurt? 
that is very rare for anyone to get hurt on those things. They make them safe. It's fun. Right? Now imagine if someone paid for you with their life to go on the wildest roller coaster ride in all of history. And you say, oh, thank you. I love you for dying for me. But I'm just going to watch. Do we not do that? And I have to wonder, not that it upsets God, but God's going, please, enjoy it. Enjoy as much as you want. I died for you. Take it all. Eat it all. Experience it all. Know me more. And not that he's disappointed in us, but I know he wants more for us. If my kids don't go on it, I'm not going to force them to go on it. But at the same time, I'm, I'll be disappointed in a sense like, oh, there is so much more for you to enjoy if you just got on the ride and went for it. And I tell you, the ride with Jesus is amazing. And I think part of it, what holds us back is holiness. And I apologize because I had to cut the message off. I don't know how long it's been. I know how long this part's been. I don't know how long the whole thing's been. But we get to this wall where I really think it's, we don't want to be more holy than we are now. We're comfortable now. We're holy enough now. We've sought God enough now. But I know that the next step would require me of taking another separation of holiness. It would require me of not being involved in this anymore. Not watching these certain things anymore. Cutting this certain thing out of my life in order to take this next step. And I think sometimes we don't like that. It puts up this wall in front of us, right? And not self-righteousness. Not, oh, look what I've done. But really, like we know that in order for us to go to China, we would have to be totally set out and not willing to be comfortable on anything. And sometimes maybe that's what we don't want to deal with. And not that God's calling any of us to go to China. It could be anywhere. It could be down the street. It could be to the pool, Nana. It could be, I don't know, just but that next step that might stop us. And I've heard, you know, even talking about sometimes we reach a wall and we think it's a wall. We can't go any further, but really we just need to look up. And oh, it's a step. And we need to go up the next step and go up the next step in life. And I think that's what holds us back is that even if it's a good thing, we don't always want to get rid of it for the better thing, that we're content with the good thing. And I think that's what's missing from a lot of believers. You know, myself included, there's things I know that, you know, for sure, always as we seek God, there's always going to be more that needs to be holy, right? But that desire for more holiness, I think a lot of a lot of Christianity in the West that I've seen just stops short of that. I've seen a lot of it on the other side that goes full on for it. And I experienced it a lot uh, come, first coming to get saved where we would worship together. I was like, oh, I could worship in my room. I'd have a little disc man and put my headphones on and worship God quietly in my room, singing out loud in my heart, but quietly with my mouth, with the headphones on, so no one would know. But I was with God. I was spending time with God. I was worshiping. I was reading the Bible, spending time with myself. I'm like, I didn't know there was this much more to it until I came to it. Worshiping with our friends in the basement, knowing, wow, we can do this. We can spend time with God. And it was some of the sweetest, best, most nourishing times of my life. Almost more nourishing than Sunday because it was different. Like Sundays were, were nourishing and it was just a different thing. But having that intimate setting together as well. And I think even that Sunday setting can be that intimate if we let it, if we do it in order. And it might be a trivial thing for someone else and huge for you now, like it was when it was time for me to quit smoking after coming to God. It was a huge thing for me, but I knew God was going to do it. I knew God was going to give me the strength to do it. And someone else might be like, oh, I never struggle with that. That's not a problem. They might be further down the road. But if, if God's put something in front of you to give up or put on or pass on, consider doing it. Just the little things like that. You'll be surprised. You take out that little thing, you'll be surprised at how much more floods in uh, into that area for you from God by His Spirit. But we stop short of that holy life, you know? We fail to see that there's more beyond. We fail to consider that there probably is more beyond that. Oh, maybe I sh if, I've never thought, well, what if God did want me to quit my job? I've never even entertained that thought. What if God did want me to leave my home? What if God, well, as you read the scriptures, you see God challenge people to do all those things. And I'm not saying quit your job. I'm not saying stop uh, eating certain things or doing certain things. Only God can. But what I'm saying is, have you ever considered it? 
Have you ever said, you know what? Maybe I should get up and leave. Maybe I should quit my job. Maybe God would want me to volunteer or, or join a ministry or move and do this. But this one thing is holding me back. And as you pray about it, God says, maybe no, don't quit your job. This is how I'm providing for you in this season. Or maybe he says, no, I don't want you to leave. Or maybe he does say, I do. I mean, there were seasons in my life when I prayed, like, God, do you want me to leave? Do you want me to go somewhere else? And God would say, no, I want you to stay here. But the point is, are we checking in with him as we're comfortable? Are we saying, God, is this, is this still what you want me to do? Sometimes we pray, God, what do you want me to do? Sometimes we pray, God, meet my need. And sometimes we don't pray, God, well, my need's met. What do you want me to do with it? My needs are met. I'm here. I'm good. But do you have something else for me now? And if you're married, there's no something else for you. <laughs> that's, that's it. But in every other decision, it's not. Pray and take that step. Pray and take that step. Because once we've begun to taste the abundance of God, we can't go back to less. Once we've begun to taste and see that He's good, whether it's stepping out and serving Him, whether it's Him giving us good things in life, we're never satisfied going back. You see someone who's backslidden, they're not happy. They're broken. You can tell that they, may, you know, maybe they're, they're enjoying their sin, but they're not fulfilled like they used to be. Because you can't be. You can never be filled with less. Once you've been stretched out by the things of God, you can never be filled again in the same way. You know, you might be wrinkled like a balloon, but you got to be filled up again with the Holy Spirit. You know, once I've had my wife's cooking, I don't want to go back to eating cereal and my own form and grill skills. In fact, I used to love grilling, but now Ashley did it once and she did it once better than I ever did it. I never want to grill, <laughs> grill again. This is so good. But... Don't let your talents be buried. You say, oh, I don't have talents. Yes, you do. You have many. God has made you special, unique, formed you, planned you before the beginning of the universe. And you think you don't have any talents? Is that not the clay saying, the potter, you can't do anything with me? Absolutely not. God has made you special and wonderful. And just because you're not up on stage and have a million followers and likes, that stuff doesn't matter. That stuff doesn't count. It's vanity. God is gifted you and talented you. In fact, he's got spiritual gifts for you too. If you would seek them, if you haven't sought them, say, God, give me these gifts. Maybe you can give me tongues when I pray to you privately. I have this language for you. Or give me the gift of prophecy or whatever gifts you have for me, God, I want whatever you have, one or all. It's by your spirit. And as we close here, God died again, like we said, to save you. He's given you His Spirit to live inside you. That in His physical absence, He sent us to be His physical presence with His Spirit inside of us. That the word Christian is little, little Jesus is. It was pejorative, right? That are we, walk, are we doing what Jesus would do, right? And not that we need to be homeless and have no place to lay our head and die by crucifixion. That was His life. But what is it for your life? Maybe it is being in a mansion like Abraham or rich like David or Solomon, but using it for His glory. Or maybe it does mean selling all your possessions and leaving them behind to come and follow Him. But the question is, what is He asking you to do? Not what is He asking someone else to do. Not what He's asking your husband or your friend or your spouse or your boss to do. But what is He asking you to do? What opportunities has He put before you that are there for you to do? To move, to go, to say, to be the person He's made you to be. Are we so afraid to stay back and miss out on those things? Do you really want to wait another day? You know, we did this last minute. I couldn't go another week without doing this again, at least for a couple of weeks, because I knew this is what God was calling us to do, at least for this season. I can't go and be satisfied anywhere else. I can only be satisfied in doing what I know God would call me to do today. In Ephesians 5, 15 through 17, if you're praying for wisdom and asking for wisdom, listen to this. See then that you walk carefully, not as fools, but as wise men, making the most of the time because the days are evil. Do you not want to make most of the time? Do you not want to be found faithful when God comes back? Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. The will of the Lord is that you would know Him, that you would follow Him, you would be known by Him, and you would make Him known. And if you're doing that in your life, I know you are. Even if you only feel like, oh, I barely do anything for God. God's like, that's awesome. I don't need you to do a million things. As long as you're doing the one tiny thing that I've asked you to do, I'm going to use it and I'm going to bless it. 
and I'm going to bless you in it. And more than that, God says, I don't need you to do anything. I just want you to know me more. I want you to be closer to me. I want you to know my love more. I want you to feel my spirit in you more and be convicted more and encouraged more and ministered to more and be alone less because you know that I'm with you and I will never leave you or forsake you. But as he says that, he also says, come follow me. He doesn't leave us sitting there. The tax collector left his booths. The fishermen left their nets. The people, the, the demoniac put his clothes back on and went back into town. The demoniac wanted to go with Jesus on the road, but Jesus said, I have molded you and made you to go back into your town and spread the gospel. The point is to follow Jesus and do whatever he says to do, that you might know him more and you might know him better and those around you would be drawn closer to him. So with that being said, I encourage you, spend that time with him today as he's been ministering to you through your whole life. Ask him, God, what? Let's pray now. God, what would you have for us? We know that we pray, Lord, we've been told to pray that your will would come and your will be done on earth as in heaven. And Lord, we want to see that happen, God. How can we be a part of that, God? What can we do with our lives to help that mission succeed that you're already doing? You don't need us to do it, but God, you want us to be a part of it and be blessed by it and to see your glory um, happen and your work's done. So God, if you want us to move, Help us move. If you want us to sell our house, quit our jobs. Uh, if you want us to double down and work harder and, and minister to those that we work with. Uh, sometimes I think it's all the above. Uh, but Lord, whatever it is you have for us, God, show us, guide us, lead us, help us take those steps of faith and to not look back, not worry what's behind us, not worry what we're going to lose in this life, but be focused about gaining things in the next life. Most of all, to know you and second of all, that others would be our treasure in heaven. We love you. God bless uh, all those who hear. And uh, God, we, uh, forgive us where we've held back. Help us to uh, be braved by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So may God bless you and keep you and his face shine upon you. There is a vineyard of the Lord. There is a vineyard for our soul. With all our troubles left behind the door, we drink first light until